Oh, of course, yeah. Well, good morning and a very warm welcome to our morning service here at Mark's Memorial Church. It's great to be back here, just back from a couple of weeks holiday myself and to see um, the view from the pulpit here once again, although still don't think I'll ever get used to seeing no one out here in front, but it's still really great that we can uh, come together and worship God, which is what we're here to do. So thank you for tuning in this morning and we do give you a warm welcome. Why don't you leave a comment in the Facebook uh, page or whatever you're listening from on, on uh, watching from on YouTube and just give us a good morning. Let us know where you're uh, tuning in from. As we begin this morning, um, just be great to refocus our hearts and our minds uh, before God. I'm just going to read to you a couple of uh, verses from a beautiful Psalm, Psalm 86. Let's read these uh, wonderful words. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You've delivered me from the depths, from the realm of the dead. You, Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Let's this morning allow the Lord to teach us his ways. Let's come before him with an attitude of worship and ask him for that undivided heart. And let's praise him with our whole hearts, our whole inward being, as that we may know and experience his goodness, his faithfulness, and his love today. We're now going to begin by singing uh, a wonderful and beautiful hymn that will uh, hopefully uh, lead us into that place of undivided worship. It is before the throne of God above. Let's sing this together from our homes, whether you're singing from in your heart or whether you're joining together as a family or on your own singing. Let's sing these words as the worship team lead us. For the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is written on his hands, my name is heaven. Tongue can bid me then steep on. No tongue can bid me then steep on. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. my 
Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and my God. One with himself I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high. With Christ my Savior and Christ my Savior and my God. Many thanks to Ian and Joe for leading us and to our entire worship team for their hard work over the lockdown period and the number of songs that we've been able to pre-record for our times of uh, corporate worship. Let's uh, now come to God in prayer and let's uh, draw our hearts near to him as we approach his throne of grace. Let us all pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with an attitude of worship because we know that you are God and because you are God, you are good, that your mercies never fail, that your grace is sufficient for us in all circumstances that we face in our lives. Lord, as the psalmist wrote there, we worship you because we are in need of you. We are poor and needy. Without you, we are lifeless and cold. We wake up without a sense of you. But when you are at the center of our lives and when we invite you in, we do know, we can know, we will know that Jesus is the difference. Lord, we thank you that Jesus is the good shepherd, that Jesus is the saving one, that Jesus is the Lord of all compassion. Oh Lord, so we worship you this morning because among the gods there is none like you and there are no deeds that can compare with yours. Lord, we live in a time where we can often become complacent and we recognize that material things, devices, social media, good things, but things can take over our relationship with you. They can take over a real and living relationship with a loving Heavenly Father. And Lord, we can sometimes lose the significance of the cross and of Jesus' death for us in our place. Yeah, Lord, when we come back to you and when we worship you, we praise you knowing that your praise, our praise toward you, that your praise is also our greatest good. And so as we read there at the beginning, as the psalmist writes, I will praise you. I will glorify your name forever for great is your love toward me. We do come with that attitude of worship to you, Lord, this morning. Because you've delivered us from the depths, because in our natural state we are opposed to you, God. But you have delivered us from the realm of the dead. And Lord, that language can sometimes be confusing to us, but we know that in a nutshell it means that we are prone to sin, we're prone to turn our own way, but because of Jesus and his deliverance from death, his resurrection from the dead, the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and his rising from the dead, that we can know freedom, forgiveness, and salvation for those who place their trust in Jesus Christ. Lord, what greater thing is there to say than this, that you've poured out your love and your goodness upon us, that you have shown your mercy toward us, that we would fear your great name and not fear anything else in the world, but fear your name because you are good and because you are holy, and so that we would delight in your great name and that we would live for the glory and honor of your great name. And so, Lord, with that in mind, we ask for an undivided heart toward you this morning. We ask this because your ways are better than our ways. Your ways are higher than our ways. Your ways are greater than our ways. And so we ask this so that we may fear your name, as we've just said. We ask that we would uh, give you a joyful, awful uh, worship and love with our entire being, that sense of undivided heart-filled worship with all the sincerity we can uh, muster within ourselves that you have uh, given us through your grace at work in us. Lord, would you help us to turn our hearts towards you, that we would give our whole self to you with an undivided heart so that your name would be glorified today, this morning, this evening in our service, and forever, Lord. Lord, it's before your throne that we turn toward today. 
and it's through the cross that we stand before your throne and are made worthy. It's before your throne that our names are written and forever uh, graven on the hands of Jesus and written on his heart. So Lord, would you take us back there this morning to the place of the cross, to Calvary's Hill where Jesus died for us. That for those of us who are Christians, Lord, for the years, we thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. For the good times, the bad times, the in-between times, the struggles, the hardships, the despairs, the joys, the encouragements, the victories. That you've been there, you've upheld us with your righteous right hand. Lord, for those of us who are not quite sure of Christianity, for those of us who have been perhaps quite hurt by the church and who find Christians repulsive, Lord, we pray for healing and that that would begin today. Lord, we confess that that may look like a long road ahead, but we're living in such a day where many questions are being asked about the Christian faith once again in our land. And Lord, as Christians, we ask that you would forgive us when and where we get it wrong, that you would forgive us when we misrepresent the name of Jesus, and that you would help us to have that undivided heart of worship toward you this morning. Lord, we commit ourselves to you afresh this day. And we ask that you would make us more aware of your presence here in our midst and in our lives as the scattered people of God as we go back to work. And for those of us who are back in work, Lord, would you give us a renewed sense of joy in our work? For those who have lost jobs and those who are now searching for employment, Lord, would you bring hope to um, despair and to discouragement, Lord? Would you bring peace and comfort in the place of trial? Lord, may you be our provider, our deliverer, our redeemer today. May you be pleased to bless us and the words that are said from here. And may you bless us from our homes, wherever we're gathered from. And would you, Lord, the great and changeable I am, the King of glory and of grace, move among us, have your way among us and go before us, that we would know that this, a sinful soul, such as we, such as I, can be counted free through the cross of your son, Jesus. Lord, this we pray as we now pray together the prayer that you taught your own disciples with the words of the Lord's prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, we do give you uh, a warm welcome to our service. And if you've been saying good morning uh, in the comments section, I know Tommy likes to always say good morning, Tommy. Uh, and, and I feel in, in, the, in the church here all, all alone, we'll have George Smith been ringing the bells this morning with me, but it's just the two of us in the sanctuary. So if you'd like to say good morning, Brian, uh, please feel free uh, and, and be at liberty to do that too. And uh, continue to keep in touch with us and engage with us by subscribing to our uh, YouTube channel, um, March Memorial TV, you type in on YouTube, uh, by liking our page and by following us on Facebook and thank you for those who are have been doing that over the last number of months and seeing um, the the people who've been gathering in and, and people who've been watching the, the services online we thank you for that and also to our website martinsmemorial.tv where you can catch up and see um, all the material uh, there the archived uh, services and we hope that they'll be a blessing to you. Uh, just a number of notices that we've been letting you know over these last weeks and months and just continuing to let you know about the Martins Help Team that's still up and running as we seek to help our own church family uh, but also our wider community here in Stornoway and throughout Lewis that we still have at an emergency food bank here at Joseph's Storehouse. If you know someone or you are in need then please do uh, get in touch with us uh, either on social media or through um, our, our, our website or down here at the church. Uh, we would um, be just really uh, appreciate uh, to, to help out anyone that you know or if you are uh, in need we have that up and running and also we've still got free free bibles uh, youth bibles for for younger folk and then um niv bibles for adults as well um so we have that free just again to put your name and address uh, and we'll post that out free of charge to you uh, and you can find the details on our website just send us a wee message and we'll be more than happy to send that to you thank you for those who have been doing that and 
just also to say about those who've been uh, giving uh, as part of their worship, thank you to the congregation here at Martins Memorial Church for their ongoing kindness to the work, uh, that's the ongoing work here, uh, and for Ian Barley, our treasurer, for all his hard work behind the scenes, and for those who have uh, been um, giving their tithes and offerings uh, to the church, and, uh, and for those who've been doing so further afield, uh, we of course um, commit that you do that to your own local church first, but we thank you uh, for those who have been generously um, donating to the work and ministry of Martins Memorial Church here for further afield and with our own congregation. And lastly, we very much uh, look forward to uh, Mr. Ali McLeod uh, preaching God's word for us this evening. So please do join in for our evening service. This starts the five minute countdown at 6.25 and Ali will be preaching on the shock of forgiveness, taking us back to the cross, the very um, center of the Christian message. Um, Ali will be preaching from Luke 23 verses 32 to 43, the shock of forgiveness. So we just, uh, it would be great that you would join in with us and uh, and pray for Ali uh, for this evening as he preaches God's word to us. Well, these are all the notices. Just wanted to say uh, a few uh, short words uh, to the younger folk. And uh, I'm just back from holiday myself with my family. And if you've uh, been away anywhere or um, you're still planning to go away anywhere before the school goes back in a couple of weeks or a week on Wednesday, uh, then, um, yeah, I, I just had a really good time uh, with my girls and with Talita. And we went to, to Edinburgh and we were staying with Talita's parents. Uh, and on one day, we went to uh, one of my favourite um, landscapes, one of my favourite pieces of architecture in the whole of Scotland. It's in a place called South Queensferry. Um, well, we actually went there to a place called the Little Bakery because they have really nice food and nice cakes there. But we did see uh, an amazing piece of structure uh, called the Fourth Road Rail Bridge. I'm sure you'll have heard of it or seen it. And there's a few photos now that will come up on your screen uh, of us there. There's a picture of the Fourth Road Rail Bridge itself there. Uh, it's a beautiful structure. Let me just, while that photo's up there, read you a few facts about this amazing bridge. So it first opened in 1890, and its main structure, portal to portal, measures at 1,630 meters. It was built using 53,000 tons of steel and six and a half million rivets. Very complex structure. Uh, and its highest point stands 110 meters above high water and 137 meters above its foundations. It's got very deep roots. I don't know what all these words mean. It just means that it's very complex and it's very high and it's very difficult to build. And normally, 200 trains would use the bridge every day. When we were in South Queen's Ferry, we saw a couple of trains passing through. Um, and normally, it says here on, on website about the bridge that 3 million passengers would be carried across the bridge every single year. And maybe we can flick on to a, another couple of pictures that we have there. There's Talita and Esther and Lydia with the Fourth Road Rail Bridge and then the Fourth Road Bridge. And then you can see in the distance the new uh, Queen's Ferry Bridge that was built uh, a couple of years ago. I don't know if it's made the traffic in Edinburgh any uh, better. There's myself and the girls there. Sorry that the, uh, the photos haven't quite... Um, jarred up my uh, computer and, and everything, but you can see me there with the, four, the girls and the Fourth Road Bridge. And then there may be one more, I think, of the girls themselves. Yes, there they are uh, with their denim jackets as, uh, yeah, seeing the, the Fourth Road Rail Bridge and the other one. Um, yeah, that, that should be actually the other two bridges. But nonetheless, um, the Fourth Road Rail Bridge, I, I lived in Edinburgh for 11 years and Every time I passed the Fourth Road Rail Bridge, it seemed like it was always needing constant work done to it. It always seemed to have like white patches on it, like, okay, there's work being done to the Fourth Road Rail, Rail Bridge. Every time I passed it by, every time I would see it, every time I go to South Queen's City, yeah, there's work being done. Um, there's always something uh, wrong with it. And actually, people in Edinburgh, apparently, or maybe it's a myth, I'm not so sure, uh, they would have a, a phrase called, it would be like painting the fourth road bridge. It was a phrase um, about the history of the bridge, apparently that when uh, you painted the whole of the fourth road rail bridge, that you would immediately have to start again. It needed constant work, um, although I don't think that's actually true. It became a phrase for Edinburgh folk that if someone took really long to do something, you'd say, well, it's like painting the fourth road rail bridge. Um, and you know, that got me thinking, 
just looking at the fourth rail bridge and how beautiful a structure it is, but the fact that it needs constant work, that for us as humans, uh, we are beautiful in God's eyes. We are made in his image and likeness. Uh, the book of Genesis tells us that when God created male and female, he created them and they were very good. Um, but sin came in and uh, into the world and, 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 and people fell and we we're, we're distanced from God. We're set, set uh, apart from God, that God is holy and, and that we're not, that we're filled with sin. And so we uh, constantly need work done in our lives. And when we come to Jesus, he makes us new that when we uh, realize and recognize that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and when we ask him for our forgiveness, we have this new life. It's called a new birth. It's something supernatural that God does in us that we become new people. We don't um, literally become new people like you might see in a film, but, but God does something by his Holy Spirit where he gives us new life and new desires. And we have these different desires that, that go towards God now, that, that the sin that separated us, now we are brought back to God. But you know, as time goes on, we realize that um, we still make mistakes. We still uh, fall short of God's standards and we still need work done just as the fourth road rail bridge does. But the good thing is that God, by his Holy Spirit, keeps repainting us and keeps remolding us and keeps refashioning us into the likeness of his son, Jesus. So can I ask you this morning, would you put your trust in Jesus? And, can you, and would you know uh, the goodness that is in God's very own character and nature that he, when he starts a good work in us and when we turn our hearts to Jesus and when we ask for his forgiveness and when we ask him to come into our lives, that God, uh, by his son Jesus and by the power of his Holy Spirit, keeps going on and on and on. And just like a train goes through the bridge and then goes to its, its final destination, one day we'll be forever with Jesus and we'll be with him and we'll see him as he truly is and will be to him as we truly should be. But until then, we ask for his help. We ask him that he would keep painting us in our lives, that we would keep growing in him by the power of his spirit. So would you do that today? And would you know God's strength for you and through you in your life? Well, we're now going to sing a, a, a wonderful song together now. It's about the friendship of Jesus, that he helps us in our trials, in our lives, and he helps us in the good points. He helps us, helps us at every point. It's a beautiful song. What a friend we have in Jesus. Let's sing this together. sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry Everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? And Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Come with a load of care precious Savior still our refuge 
Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. And in his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. Wonderful uh, worship song there. Thanks to Ian and Matthew for leading us in that. We're now going to turn to the scriptures now, and our Bible reading this morning is taken from uh, the letter First uh, Peter and chapter one, and we're going to read the whole chapter together. First Peter chapter one. The words will appear on your screen. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into, an, in, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of of your souls. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, Live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. So, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply, deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Amen. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his own holy and inspired word. In our prayer time this morning, we're going to be thinking about Christians at this very moment who are being told to renounce their faith in Jesus, who have been told that they'll have their coronavirus aid support from their, for their families taken away from them, these are Christians who are being persecuted in various points of the world, uh, most notably in Southeast Asia, 
in Vietnam and other countries, and also in Africa and places like Sudan. Uh, various reports are highlighting this this persecution that's intensifying at this very moment. Uh, and Open Doors, an uh, international reporter, Open Doors being a charity that um, looks out for those who are uh, the, the persecuted church, and, and uh, it's a really great organization. But a, a reporter there has um, given information that uh, they've been in, inundated with reports of Christians uh, telling them that their communities uh, would only give them food if they reconverted back to their original faith, which in many instances is Islam. So just um, we recognize the horrors and the injustice, injustices that are being um, portrayed or are, are not being really portrayed in our, our media, but, also, but we, we do recognize that um, we need to pray for our brothers and sisters across the world uh, who are suffering uh, really greatly at this time, who are really struggling and who are um, not doing good. And so as uh, the people of God, as the, the global body of Christ, we, we come together uh, and let's now pray for uh, these people um, together as we gather our hearts. So let's all pray. Our loving Lord and faithful Heavenly Father, the God of all compassion who comforts those in trouble, who brings hope to seemingly hopeless situations. We draw near to you this morning as our rock and our refuge and our hope. And we come before you remembering our brothers and sisters persecuted in the global church. Lord, we know that the Christian faith doesn't promise us a comfortable life. Christ promises hope, meaning, peace, purpose and joy but not comfort. And so we pray this morning for those who follow in the footsteps of Jesus. We remember those at this time in countries across Southeast Asia and in Sudan, for those who have been denied food unless they reconvert back to their original faith, for those who are feeling the strain even to the point of contemplating suicide amidst the intensifying persecution they're facing. Lord, when we read the scriptures, we think of your servant Elijah, who himself, after experiencing great victory, would then face extreme depression and anxiety to the point of death. Lord, at that point, you spoke the word of truth to his heart. And although we know not the words to pray for our brothers and sisters across the world at times, we ask that the way maker, the miracle worker, the light and the darkness, Jesus, would shine his light into this dark and seemingly hopeless and desperate situation. For those, Lord, who are being denied both food and coronavirus aid, God of the breakthrough, would you reconcile this situation? Would you grant favor to your people? Would you grant strength and comfort where there's suffering and loss of hope and the temptation to give up? Would you bring hope and healing a deep assurance of salvation, just as we read earlier in Psalm 86, that when the people cry out, hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Lord, would you guard the lives of those who trust in you? Would you save your servants who trust in you? Would you, for those who call out and say, you are my God, would you have mercy on them, Lord? May you have mercy on those who call to you all day long. Lord, would you revo reward their faithfulness, Lord? Would you save them? Defender of the weak, Lord, you have made all nations and all one day will come and bow before your throne. And Lord, as we think of that thought, we trust everything to your name. We thank you for the privilege to pray for one another, to carry each other's burdens, thus fulfilling the law of Christ. Lord, we recognize that we are so well off and we're so comfortable, we, we often don't realize it. We don't know the experience of the threats of death and starvation of being forced to convert back to another faith. Lord, for all our Christian brothers and sisters in these lands, for those weak and strong, for those who are mature, for those who are new believers, may they be granted a fresh awareness and consideration of who you are, of who Jesus is, who himself endured such opposition from sinners, but for, who, but for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and who now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. In and through that promise, Lord, may your children across the world not grow weary and lose heart. And Lord, we don't want to forget also our own island and for those who are suffering at this time and for those who are grieving, 
We recognize the need to pray for those who are mourning. We remember today the Afrin family at this time, for our own Reverend Norman Afrin and his dad, our own member Norman, who are grieving at the loss of a father and a granddad today. Lord, would you bless them and draw near to them at this time, we pray. Would you draw near to that entire family? Would you draw near to all who call upon you today, Lord? Would you bind up wounds, bring healing and comfort to the brokenhearted? This we pray today, Lord, and tomorrow and the next day, asking for your, inter your divine intervention to take place, Lord. For we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. We're now going to sing another song together, The Splendor of the King, How Great is Our God. Let's sing this together. Great. 
one, two, hello. Apologies there, folks. We lost uh, audio there for a moment or two, but now we're now back. Thank you for staying with us. You know, growing up on the island, I've had the great privilege and blessing to have had strong Christian roots. I was brought up going to church uh, every week. I was brought up hearing the Christian gospel message in churches. I have uh, basically no excuse for uh, not being a Christian because I, I've heard uh, it many, many times. And I became a Christian when I was a teenager, but I, I've really always uh, believed there was a God. I've not walked into faith blindly, but um, I have been a Christian for, for many years now. And so from my upbringing uh, in the free church where my parents brought me to church, and, and then when I uh, became a member here in Mark's Memorial Church as a teenager, I'm uh, forever grateful for that, for shaping who uh, I've uh, become and who, who I am becoming. Um, but you know, what often happens when you tell someone that you've become a Christian, uh, you, you tell someone who's maybe not a Christian, you say, hey, I've, I've, I'm now a Christian. Um, and they might give you a response that's like, well, sure, give you. Or they might say, but why? Why Christianity? And that can be particularly the case when you're from the island because to others, maybe at times understandably so, sometimes Christianity can be looked upon from the place of what Christians don't do. Well, Christians don't get drunk, they don't party, they don't live immorally, at least they're told not to, they're told not to lie, cheat, you know, steal or do things like that. Uh, well, and maybe we're, we, look, we hear things like that, and we're like, that's not maybe a, a bad thing. We, you know, we all live by, by someone's laws, someone's worldview, someone's rules. But sometimes uh, maybe people have looked at Christians in the past and, uh, or, or today, and, and they say, well, they've extended this, these rules to things like dress codes. And so, you know, Christianity becomes about what you wear, and it has to be a black suit. You, you, you maybe uh, have to just look smart by, for going to church. Uh, if you're a woman, you have to wear a, a hat or something. I'm not going into that discussion, but, you know, it, it becomes about what you wear. And, and then maybe it, it becomes about how you look. So you've got to now put on a, a, a doer face. You've got to look miserable. So it seems on the outside, and of course, um, I've, I've met many, many Christians who may, um, you know, to be honest, look a little bit uh, sour-faced, uh, but they are the warmest, gen most genuine people that you could wish to meet, the most kind people. But on the outside, sometimes it looks like a badge of honor, maybe, to, to look a bit uh, <laughs> sour-faced. And so to others, Christianity may, be seem, may seem to look like adding on more laws. Uh, for instance, we could also say, um, thou shalt not hang thy washing on, uh, the, on thy line on the Sabbath, or um, thy swings in Don Park shall be tied up on the Sabbath. I, I mentioned these two things because it's actually, it's quite funny really, you know, it's quite silly. And so on the outside, people look at traditional Christianity about, well, this is what you can't do. And so it's, it's boring. I, I don't want... A part of that. And so that was, it made, that's maybe kind of an island experience. And so when I moved to the mainland uh, in 2008, and I was just about, I was 18, about to turn 19, and I, I saw another side of the, the spectrum. And so we, I, when I use the word spectrum, I'll, I'll maybe just give a few examples of this. So just uh, to give one, uh, firstly, I, uh, of course, I'm training to be a minister in the Church of Scotland, and as part of my um, training, I have to attend various conference, conferences. And my uh, recent probationers conference, we were uh, paired off in groups and we were asked as probationers to look at a thing called a parish profile, which is in essence that a church who's vacant and without a minister and they're allowed to call a minister, they have to create a parish profile and it gets put on their website and on the Church of Scotland's website uh, publicly. And so we were asked as a group of um, trainee ministers to look at three parish profiles uh, and, and some were very good uh, and some were, were not as good and, and you know some looked really professional, again some not as professional, that's fair enough. Um, and we were look, asked to look at one particular uh, Edinburgh church. It's a, 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 a pretty notable church. It's a, it's a very wealthy church. Um, and on the outside, everything looked immaculate. There were 25 pages of a parish profile. Uh, it looked great. They were doing a lot of community outreach, a lot of good things going on. But one of the candidates noticed something. And in the midst of this PDF document, I think in you know, Adobe, you could uh, type in the search bar, type in the word, and see how much a word appeared. And so they did this for the words God and Jesus. And both appeared in this 25-page uh, parish profile once each. 
God and Jesus in a prospective church booklet, a, bullet, um, a church parish profile for a prospective minister. God was only mentioned once, Jesus was only mentioned once, and we were left thinking, well, why is that? So that's maybe one example of another side of this, the spectrum where, where, where God doesn't really get mentioned um, at all. And so we're like, well, okay, we're trying to be so like what, what um, the world, we're trying to integrate ourselves as a church into what the world says so much that, well, we're maybe not going to mention God so much. And maybe just to give another example of this, again, recently, I'm just back from holiday, and uh, earlier this week, I was on Princess Street in Edinburgh, went into Waterstones Bookshop there, and uh, there was a book by a notable Edinburgh author, and this uh, author was previously the Bishop of Edinburgh. He was previously the uh, presiding bishop for a major denomination in Scotland, uh, and he now calls himself an after-religionist. He calls himself an agnostic atheist. That's the kind of person that you want to be a faith leader, isn't it? No. I mean, here's one of his infamous quotes here. He says, there may be no God of the universe, but let's live as though there is. And even if we are wrong, it'll be a glorious way to be mistaken. And so when I say the other side of the spectrum, I hope these two maybe rather devastating portrayals sketch out quite clearly what I mean by that. And, and why maybe people on this island maybe decry uh, more traditional forms of religion and see it as uh, stuffy or, or formal or see it as um, people looking, um, you know, do it or whatever. And not this other side of things, it doesn't actually have anything to offer, especially to a world at the moment asking many questions. You see, for all the flaws that traditional forms of Christianity have or have had, uh, on this island especially, whatever the flaws that more progressive, uh, more, um, at least in terms of looking to be more part of the world and what the world looks like, uh, a type of Christianity, the hard reality, the harsh reality is that for each and every one of us, we will one day appear before God's judgment seat. You see, as a boy here in Lewis, that was a scary thought for me. It put the fear of God into me, literally. I would sing Psalm 23 to myself in bed every night. I would pray the Lord's Prayer in bed every night. I hoped that that would get me into heaven. I hoped that would let me tick the good book. Uh, I, I was a goody two-shoes in school as well. My, my brothers will tell uh, you that. My parents uh, know that. I, I never really got into trouble um, you know, I was just such a little goody two shoes. Uh, that's a good thing. I'm not knocking on that, but I thought that would actually save me as well. But it, but that didn't, and I and I came to a place where I knew that that wouldn't save me. It didn't stop me asking questions. I, I, I like I say, I've, I feel I've always believed in God from when I was a young boy, and, and I give thanks to my upbringing, my parents, and, and and the free church along the road, and and to Mark's Memorial Church for that. But I've not walked blindly into faith. There was something about the existence of God that made me stop and think, uh, well, maybe there's more to life than this. Maybe God really does love me. And, and if he does, well, that's both terrifying as it is freeing. It's terrifying because, well, I've heard the message of Christianity time and time again. and I've not done anything about it yet officially. I've not told people. This is you know, me thinking about becoming a Christian. And it's also amazingly freeing because surely I must do something, not because I'm scared into it, not because I've been in, in, indoctrinized into some cult, but I, I, I believe this person, Jesus, is real. I believe that God is real. He loves me. And I believe that God's Holy Spirit has been sent into the world so that we can live differently. And so what brought me to faith in Jesus Christ is God, was God's own pursuing, his continual pursuing of me, his continual knocking on the door of my heart, and his ever-increasing awareness of the reality that he is God, that God is God, and that I'm not. In short, I'm a sinner. No matter how good I can look or be or try to be, the fact is, by nature, I'm bound to hell. I am in opposition to God. But here's the thing. Here's the thing that's freeing that in God's great mercy toward me and toward you and I that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to pay the penalty for my sin to die in my place so that I would know freedom so that I would inherit eternal life so that I would be born again. Okay, maybe you're thinking, okay, I've used a few Christian 
words now. I'm stepping into the Christian lingo. I'm using eternal life and born again. What does this all mean? Well, I hope you'll join me just in a short journey this morning as we look about what this means from the Bible because I believe the Bible to be God's uh, own word, God's authoritative word, uh, and, and that in the Bible we, we see the whole story unfolding of God's um, love for humanity and we see it most powerfully demonstrated in his own love for us that while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. I mean what is this? It is an act of grace. It is God's unmerited favor toward us. It means that we can't earn it. We can't try to be good. We we don't deserve it. It's simply God doing something for us with no strings attached. It doesn't cost us anything but it costs God's own son Jesus his very life so that we would receive eternal life. Jesus paid the great penalty, the great price for our sins. Our debt was paid and we were made right with God when we trust in him as our savior. That's grace. And grace gives way to a hope, a living hope that enables us to live life to the full. This is my story. I'm telling you here because the title of my message this morning is Why I Am a Christian. And so it's part testimony, but it's also part message because the Bible tells us our unfolding story of who we're to become more like Jesus and how we're to live our lives. The Bible is totally relevant. It's not a book that's just there to be stared at on our, on our shelf or there to, to collect dust. It is God's real, living, and active word. If you're someone who relates to, to my story, you're, you're a, maybe a good person, you pay all your taxes, you, you've got decent models, you, know, you, you live an upright life, maybe you sit there too, and maybe you're wondering still, what is this Christianity all about? Or maybe you are uh, someone who you, you, you feel you've blown it. But can I say this? You're never beyond the reach of God's love. You and I, we're, we're never beyond the reach of his love, and we're never beyond the boundaries of his grace. And so this morning as we just look into God's word for a little while, I hope that we see our own story in it. I hope we regain our own focus through it and I hope that we live our lives as we should do by it. So just looking at the first few words that we see in this passage, there's three things that we know about the follower, followers of Jesus in Peter's day from the opening sentences. And firstly, they're, they're God's elect. They're God's chosen, beloved um, followers. They are part of God's family. Uh, second, they lived as resident aliens. They, they were exiles. Peter calls them exiles. Maybe you remember the song by Sting, uh, Englishman in New York. You know, I'm an alien. I'm a legal alien. I'm an Englishman in New York. I'm not going to sing that, but you know, it's a bit like that. The Christians, they were resident journeymen. They were traveling in um, unknown lands. They were seen as a bit strange in the eyes of others. Uh, so that's the second thing. The third thing is that they're a scattered people. They're scattered servants of God. They're a holy blend of both Jew and Gentile Christians in the church. And we, we, we see that they're going through fiery trials. They were suffering persecution. Uh, and Peter, in this short wee letter, uh, on at least 15 occasions, refers to suffering. And so that's three things we know about the followers of Jesus. And then going into straight, straight into verse 2, Peter responds to this uh, by using the usage of three, again, only referring to God in three persons, the Holy Trinity, Father, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. We see that God the Father has chosen his people for such a time as this, that the Holy Spirit uh, sanctifies them. In other words, he puts them up to the task by making them more like Jesus, uh, whose obedient death, a life they were to aspire to, and in whose death they were forgiven and set free from their old way of living. In other words, the Father chooses and he loves, the Son saves, and the Spirit empowers. It's because of this that Peter could conclude his introduction to this letter with two very famous, and they are Christian, words, grace and peace. He says grace and peace to them. And these are reasons that I am a Christian. But he doesn't just say uh, grace and peace. He says grace, grace and peace be yours in abundance. In abundance. Maybe we think of the word abundance. Uh, we might want to think back to when I preached in Ephesians 3. About a month or so ago, Paul writes there that I pray out of God's glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. That out of God's glorious riches, out of the abundance that are, that are out of God's 
that is out of God's character, that comes from his character, and that is part of his essence and his being. I think we could apply that to the words uh, in abundance here because basically we can never fully explain the depths of God's love for us, the length that Christ went to on the cross, and the amazing uh, power of his resurrection uh, now living in and through us, and the measure of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that fills us, and that continually fills and equips us in our lives. It seems that while I can't I fully explain what that means. Peter can't either. That's why he uses that it's out of the abundance of God's amazing grace. It's out of uh, the very core of the Christian message, what it means to, to be a person of grace, to be a person who lives out grace. Because grace is God's unmerited favor toward us. It, grace sets the Christian faith apart from every other world religion. It is love. It is free of charge. It is no, with no strings attached. And so when Peter is writing to say that these exiles, um, he's saying grace and peace to you. He's saying this is the amazing gift that God alone gives what a beautiful and rich introduction to, to the letter that says, wow, this is why you're Christians. You know grace. You receive grace upon grace. You're living it out. You know the peace of Christ. Even though you're going through fiery trials, you know the peace that God gives because it is supernatural. You know, there's some really great worship songs, some great uh, Christian songs being birthed around the world in this day. Of course, we have um, sung the blessing here. This has been a, uh, an amazing blessing to the entire global church, and we've seen numerous versions of it uh, on, on YouTube throughout uh, various languages. But, you know, in church circles, there's sometimes a myth that for those who do contemporary worship music don't value uh, theology and truth, but... You know, that, that's a great shame because a group called Hillsong, you may have heard of uh, Hillsong, uh, they released a new album last year. And what I really appreciate about Hillsong uh, and their music is that they, uh, it's their ability to communicate the truth of God in fresh uh, yet relative ways. Uh, and one of the songs that I've been really enjoying over the past uh, year or so has been the song King of Kings. And this is what the songwriter, Brooke Ligertwood, says about it. She says, it's a deeply theological song because theology releases praise. When we believe correctly about God, when we understand and get a greater revelation of who he is and what he's done, we can't help but respond in worship. Let me just read you a few lyrics in that song to follow on from that. And the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good, for the lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free, for the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Beautiful truths about God this is grace and peace in abundance. This is the love of Christ resurrecting us. This is the spirit of God igniting a passion within us. This is the love of the, factor, the, love of the Father showing his adopting work uh, in us. You know, this is one of the reasons I'm a Christian because when I first got saved, my life was changed by Jesus. I, I just couldn't get enough of, of reading the Bible you think, why, why read the Bible? I just couldn't get enough of it. I couldn't get enough of spending time with God and learning more about God, on getting to know God as my Father, on living like Jesus Christ, on, on listening to music, new music that, that had its own genre, worship music, uh, learning more about God, reading uh, great books uh, about God. Because when God enlightened my heart and my emotions, he also lit a fire in my mind too. This is the wonder and the beauty of discovering more about God, the truth of who he is and who he reveals himself to be. And so if you're just unsure about Christianity and the claims of Jesus, then can I simply ask you, have you read the Bible? Have you read it lately or are you making an assumption about what it says? What about the claims of Jesus himself? What about the early church as we're reading this morning? What about the so-called controversial character that is the Apostle Paul? Speaking of controversial, what about, what about the Old Testament? Well, can I say this to you, that every time I'm tempted 
to go my own way. Every time I'm tempted to see God in a different light, every time I'm inclined to do things on my own, that God reminds me, he pulls me back to his word, the Bible. If you and I long for that fullness of life that God promises, we must head back to the Bible because without it, we become fruitless, but with it, we're inclined to be not only faithful, but zealous and passionate for his glory. God longs more than a life lived for him. He wants us to live with him, our whole lives dedicated to him, a people who are defined by whose we are. You know, in the difficult climate we currently live in, the world around us is wondering if the rumors are true that God, is he real, is he good, is he loving? Search the Bible to see if it's true. Join in with our church community online and as we hopefully open our doors very soon, why don't you come and see what Jesus is like? The church is the place where God wants to confirm this, that he is real, he is good, and he is loving. Maybe you're watching this morning and you're just thinking, what's, what's this going on? Something in my heart, God is wrestling. There's a wrestling match going on. You, you know that there's something true about Christianity, but maybe you're not willing to admit it just yet. Maybe you feel you're not in that place. What now? What now? What, something's caught your attention. Maybe you just need to go back to, you need to maybe start reading God's word or go back to God's word and see what Jesus says about himself, see what God says about himself there. I mean, where do we start? We could start reading the gospel, start reading the gospel of uh, John, or maybe if you wanted a short introduction, Mark is the shortest gospel. It's a a real, um, wow, it goes from one story to one story to one story to the, it focuses on the death of Jesus. Maybe you want to start there or maybe you wanted to read something that points toward Jesus like the, the, the prophet Isaiah and the Old Testament alongside that or you wanted to read about how to pray, you wanted to read the Psalms. In a nutshell, why don't you see what God is like by reading his Bible? And why don't you ask him to reveal himself to you? Our time is uh, running uh, short this morning, and I hope you just give me a few, uh, maybe five to t- ten uh, minutes. Um, the next section we see in this passage, verses three to twelve, that give us many more reasons, and give me many reasons to say, "This is why I'm a Christian." And the first word is mercy. Uh, if grace means getting a free gift, if grace means literally God's riches at Christ's expense, the acronym grace, then if it means that we get what we don't deserve, then God's mercy is us not getting what we do deserve. Because we read that God here in his mercy, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth. We're looking at that language a bit earlier on. We've been born again, this new birth, this Christian language. In other words, God shows his love and his compassion toward us. God comes down in the person of Jesus Christ and Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Maybe you don't know much of the Bible, but if you do, you might know one verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Then again, we see that very Christian language of eternal life, that if you put your trust in Jesus, you're born again and you have eternal life. It's not just fire insurance policy to get away from the fire of hell and into the gates of heaven. It is an eternal hope. It is God's mercy in action, the cross of Jesus. It is God's great mercy. It is the abundance of God played out in the sending of God's one and only son for our bringing us back to himself. This is part of God's entire plan. It stretches throughout the entire history of humanity, of God reaching into humanity's story and the story of the Bible. You know, if you ever thought the Old Testament was scary to read, then Peter actually is reflecting Old Testament language by his use of the word in God's great mercy because we see this described uh, the greatness of God and the wideness of God's mercy in Exodus 34 the second book of the Bible where Moses has is standing before the Lord we read there that the the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with Moses and Moses began proclaiming his name the Lord the Lord and he passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord the Lord the compassionate and gracious Lord slow to anger abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. This is God's mercy in action through, uh, shown through uh, Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of the plan of God in the Old Testament. The greatness of God and the mercy of God is the very reason 
that I am a Christian because, as I said earlier, as a sinner, I stand in opposition to God, but God in his great mercy saved me, even though I may look like a good person. I may be well behaved. I may have been good. I may have been brought up well, but if I don't know Jesus, then actually I, 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 it's, it's worth nothing. Maybe now you wonder, like, why, why is it Christians, why do they gather together? Why do they like that so much? Why do, they, why do they like to sing to God? Why do they like to pray to God? Why do they like to read the Bible together? Why do they like to hear a sermon, God's word proclaimed from a pulpit? It's because there's something supernatural that's happened, that God in his mercy has saved us. He's given us a new birth, that we've been born again. A true Christian should be different, should act different, should live different, not because any Christian thinks that they're better, but because we need the help, we need all the help we can get, is because we've been born again into this living hope. We have our hope is set on something, is set on a person, and his name is Jesus, this eternal hope. The Bible has this eternal perspective from beginning to end because the Bible ultimately points to Jesus. The Christian author Max Lucado sums it up well. The Bible is, Bible is a future-facing book through the Bible, God urges us to set our hope on eternal life. This living hope is Jesus himself. Life to the full can alone be found in him, that through his resurrection from the dead, he's given us an amazing inheritance. He promises us an amazing inheritance for all eternity. He promises us by his power to keep us through faith in him. He promises to come help us again in our time of need. He promises to come at the end of time to make all things new. He promises to comfort us in our suffering. He promises to reward us when we stick close to him when times get rough. He promises us his love that enables us to love him in return through faith. And he promises that even though we've not seen him, to fill us with an inexpressible and glorious joy, an abundance of great joy that we can't explain with mere words. But because we've experienced this new, wor new birth, this eternal hope, this living hope, we can live out as Christians. That's me going through verses three to nine very quickly if you want to check that out later. But won't you know this yourself and your own life? And if you already do, do you just need some encouragement this morning, some taking away of hearing this once again of what it means to be a follower of Jesus? Do you need some renewed vigor um, for the name of Jesus and for following Jesus and for praying for our family, our friends, our work colleagues, our neighbors, those around us, knowing that Jesus alone is the hope bringer that if there's a situation that seems too big or there's a, um, something going wrong in your life that we, you can bring it to him. Or maybe you're just enjoying a bit of time from holiday and things are going well at the moment. Well, keep the praise party rolling because that's sometimes the best thing you can do. Whatever your circumstance, whatever your situation, know that God wants to be in a relationship with you. He wants to give you this new birth it is only us, through a sovereign work of God that this can happen. And will you know the living hope this morning, Jesus Christ? If I can have a final five minutes of your time, uh, we, we're looking at uh, what it means to have this new way of living. Uh, now we see in the verses 13 to 16, if I can skip to there, um, that Jesus calls his people to a different way of living. It's not just that we have, like I said earlier, fire insurance policy <laughs> from, from the fires of hell and into the gates of heaven. It's that we are called to live differently. Let's read verses 13 to 16 uh, together. It says there, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming at the very end of time. As obedient children, God's children, God's elect, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. When, Paul writes, when Peter writes there, for it is written, be holy because I'm holy, he's actually quoting the Old Testament again, the book of Leviticus. If verses three to 12 speak of the amazing transformation of the new birth taking in place in the heart of a human uh, when God works within them, then these verses tell us of the calling of a Christian, a very different way of living. It's not merely do good, be good, try to be a good person. 
I wonder if you've ever given that excuse when a Christian uh, tells you that, like, why, why did you become a Christian? What, what's, what's holding you back from Christianity? Well, I'm a, I'm a good person. I try to you know, live an upright life, and that's enough for me. I, I just try to be a good person. That's the great question of voider, though, because we see from the Bible that it's not enough to just be good. In fact, a Christian, someone who follows Jesus, is called to be holy. In the Bible, the word holy is a very serious thing. It's an absolutely vital aspect of God's character. It it expresses God's absolute separation from evil because God is intrinsically holy and calls his people to be holy. He himself is the very standard of holiness. This is why in verses 13 to 16, Peter speaks of being alert in the world, to be sharp, to be on guard, to be alert, to be self-controlled, it's about living differently. I'm sorry if you're an experience of church and you're not a Christian, you're watching this morning uh, and, and it's been a poor one where you've seen Christians not living out uh, a, a Christian looking life. I'm sorry if you've been rejected or felt rejected. I'm sorry. I know it's maybe easy for me to stand here and simply say sorry, but I know what that looks like. Um, I, I don't know what that looks like and, and living that out, what, the difficulties you may face. But can I plead with you that Jesus is the difference maker. For all Christians who have failed, and myself included, I know I have and continue to do so, Jesus is the perfect one, and he is the difference maker. He alone can change lives. Will you at least speak to him, ask him to reveal himself to you today? This is why I'm a Christian, because for all the times I get it wrong, I know I can't live a good life on my own strength. A good life is one that pleases God, that submits to God, that is holy. Holiness, summed up by the great Christian writer A.W. Tozer, is the way God is. And to be holy does not conform to a standard because God is that standard. God is absolutely holy with an infinite, incomprehensible fullness of purity. Do you see the language that he's using here? The abundance of God's character, God's great mercy, he saved us. And if God has great mercy and an abundance of grace and peace given to us, then surely he will give us that so that we will live holy lives. But we must submit to him. There was a 1972 interview with the BBC broadcaster, Joan Bakewell, and the preacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones. And he was asked by her why he thought that a sense of sin was necessary in order to be saved. She put it to him that sin wasn't really of any concern to most people. How could his way, she asked, prevail? Well, he responded like this. It certainly could, his way. Let people hear about themselves. Let them hear the Ten Commandments then they will be ready to listen to the message of the New Testament. It is because we have become ignorant, we no longer know about God and the Bible. After the cameras were turned off, Joel Bakewell continued the discussion and she was fascinated by this preacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones. She confessed that his kind of Christianity was not one she'd ever met before. The previous clerics that she had interviewed were concerned to assure her that she was a Christian, but Martin Lloyd-Jones was the first to tell her that she wasn't. The Christian life is different. It's a holy calling for holy living. Tread carefully. Enter at your peril. Yet the free invitation that Jesus Christ offers is here for you. God is knocking at the door today. How many of us tuned in been tuning in, maybe you don't know Jesus yet, but you know about Christianity in some senses. You may be able to judge it well from the outskirts. You may be what a member of a church, but are no longer. You know how to sing a hymn well, or a psalm, or a song. You know how to read the Bible, maybe you still do regularly. You know how to say a prayer. But do you know this Jesus, the difference maker, the living hope? Have you been born again? Do you know eternal life? Are you living for eternity or are you living for the, the now moments? Do you know Jesus on a deep and personal level? Because one day we'll all stand before God. One day 
we'll all stand to give an account before him. We'll all die. We're, we're humans. We're mortal. God, though, always has been, always will be. And will you and I be with him in eternity? This is the assurance that God gives to those who trust in him. Those who ask for his forgiveness. We'll all have to give an account for what we've done here on earth with our lives, for good or bad. Everyone from Gandhi to Martin Luther King to Donald Trump, all will stand before God's judgment seat. Billy Graham was one of the greatest Christians who ever lived. He won't be judged based upon how many he preached to, and it was said that he preached to over two billion people. But he will be judged on how well he represented Jesus. He will be judged on what he has done with God's son, Jesus. Kylie Jenner won't be judged for how much she charges for an Instagram post, but she will be judged by what she's done with Jesus. Do you swear allegiance to the one true king today? Is he your living hope? Do you cling to his cross? Do we, as Christians, cling to his cross? Do we believe in his resurrection? Do we live out our lives as real Christians? to the praise and glory of God because a real Christian life when we're set apart and live holy lives it's all for God's praise and glory this is why Peter can write praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because God has done a work in us let it be so that the answer is a yes and amen for you and I I'll close with this quote Chris, from Chris Sinkinson who says this Jesus came into this world as the suffering servant but one day he will return as the conquering king on that day, the time of choices will be over. We will either meet Jesus as our loving Lord or be confronted by him as our holy judge. Today is the day to get right with God so that we are ready for that final day. Are you and I ready for that day? You've heard the Christian gospel message here. What are you gonna do with it? This is why I am a Christian, because I believe with my whole heart, 100% it to be true. 100%. That's how much you can cast everything on Jesus. You can have an undivided heart toward him because he is worthy and he died for you in your place. Amen. We're now going to close by singing a final song together and it is a beautiful song uh, led by a worship team. It's called living hope. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I cannot climb In desperation I turn to hell Yes. 
Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining in with uh, us this morning, uh, and thanks to our worship team there for uh, leading us in that final song to Inez and Emily. And um, yeah, we hope you were blessed and encouraged by the message this morning and by the service. Thank you for your comments and uh, for tuning in with us. And please uh, do join with us this evening from 6:25 in our countdown, uh, as we have Mr. Ali McLeod preaching, which will be a wonderful time together. So we look forward to doing that. Uh, but until then, we are going to close by saying the benediction blessing together. The words will appear on the screen now. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day and forevermore. Amen. God bless.